Hi guys, it's KJ from For Life Coaching with another episode of former NCAA athletes stories of triumph. So today, today I have Nicholas Saunders. He's with Elizabeth City State University. He is the uh, defensive coordinator coach, defensive back coach. There we go. Defensive back coach, special teams coach, and also uh, recruiting coordinator. So um, recruiting coordinator, those got to you guys, especially if you're interested in playing for Elizabeth City State University. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Nicholas before we, um, before we engage in our conversation uh, today about, about kinesiology, the impact factor. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Nicholas. Nicholas, is, Nicholas comes to us from Chicago, Illinois, or is it Crete, is it, or is it Crete Money, Illinois? Which one? Uh, so yeah, it's Chicago, Illinois. Crete Money is the high school. Okay. So he comes to us from Chicago, Illinois, and he, um, in high school, in high school, he played football and he played baseball. He was an all-star in both sports. So all-star, I mean, he, he actually was a conference, um, he was all conference four years in both sports. So uh, that's, that's pretty huge. I like that. I like that. So, um, so after playing baseball and football in high school, he decided to go to college and pursue football. So he went to Alcorn State University in Mississippi. So he went from Chicago to Loman, Mississippi and played at Alcorn State University. There he was a four-year letterman. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, all right. Four-year letterman at, Al at Alcorn State University. And they, he actually helped lead his team to the SWAC, SWAC championship and the Black College National Championship. Am I correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, then afterwards, he went to graduate school. He went to graduate school at Arkansas State University. Southern Arkansas. Southern Arkansas, yeah. Southern Arkansas State University. Yes. Okay. Southern Arkansas State University, where he majored in kinesiology. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I'm sorry, he got his under, undergraduate degree in bi biology. So he majored mm -hmm. in kinesiology and was a graduate si assistant in charge of running backs. Um, during his time there, he actually helped coach them to the largest amount of rush, rushing yards in 10 years over 10 years, um, since 10 years prior. Um, he helped to secure consecutive winning seasons for the team and also an appearance in the Agent Barry Live United Bowl game. Um, fast forward, he is uh, currently working at Elizabeth City State University, as I said. And while here, while there, um, he has mentored athletes to uh, successful successful accomplishments. So uh, such as uh, rush, uh, rush, rushing for 1500 yards, um, backfield reception, 500 yards, and offensive average of 350 yards per game. So as you can see, he is a superstar on and off the field. Nicholas, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Nicholas, you got a smile too. So that way, if I get nervous, I can just look over and see smile and know everything's going to be okay. That's all right. I like that. <laughs> so, Nicholas, I want to talk to you. You are from Chicago. Yeah. Here, tell me a little bit about be growing up in Chicago and playing football and everything. Um. Well, I mean, growing up in Chicago was great. It isn't, well, I, I it wasn't as bad as it is now i'll say i guess because we have another coach here on staff that's from chicago as well and we always talk you know it was it was bad but it wasn't as bad as it is now where we're constantly on the news for you know shootings and murders and things like that so there was never a time where it was like i couldn't go outside um, and now at this point it's almost like you know i have younger brothers and it's almost where you're like, yeah, you don't need to go over to that part of the neighborhood or something like that. So it was never really that terrible um, for me growing up. So but, wait, are you from you know, Chicago? Like, are you from the actual mm -hmm. city, Chicago? Yeah, from the south side of Chicago. Because yeah. it says Crete Money, which is not. I mean, yeah, Crete Money is in Crete, Illinois. So we moved there. So I did half of my life in Chicago, and then my brothers were born, and then we moved 
Um, so they spent their whole life in Crete, and I was kind of the half and half. I was the city guy, and then moved to the suburb. So I had, you know, a balance of the both uh, of the two, I should say. So all my friends were still in the city, and then I made new friends as well uh, in Crete. So it was it was a good time, but I mean, just that from that point, uh, growing up there, like I said, it was I didn't really play sports when I was in the city. Um, you know, as a, as a, any type of team, uh, everything there was kind of, we did it in the yard or in the street at the park or, you know, in the alley or something like that. So once we moved to Crete, uh, it was kind of a big deal, you know, kind of to play sports. Um, and I kind of got involved early, but never football was never a thing that I could play. Um, you know, my mom didn't want me playing football. She was, uh, he's small, and I was a smaller kid, of course, but, uh, you know, I was tough. It, you know, in my opinion, I thought I was real tough. It couldn't nobody hurt me, so, uh, but she wouldn't let me play. So the only thing I could play early on was basketball and baseball. Uh, those were my only two options, and uh, baseball was kind of my, it, well, it's always going to be my first love. It's my favorite sport uh, still to this day. Um, so baseball, I excelled in early on and then went from there and uh got to high school and that's when I was finally allowed to you know play football and from there it kind of just took off um and I just stayed with football and baseball and you know tried to make the best of each and every situation so I funny story my daughter and I went to Chicago or went to Illinois because she was going to run I can't remember if it was Peoria and Springfield and I had okay. been to Chicago before, right? I, I'd been to Chicago, went there for a sales conference. It snowed <laughs> all my, all my, January 15th, right? It was uh, yeah. Martin Luther King's birthday, snowed. So none of my coworkers could get in because it was a national sales meeting. So all we did was Mother's, Baja Beach Club and the hotel. You know where I'm talking about yeah, that area, right? Yeah, yeah. So I brought my daughter back and we, I was thinking that we were going to, it was going to look like Chicago. But when we were going to wherever it was, I can't remember if it was Peoria or Springfield, all we saw were these wind turbines. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's two different places. So it's it's funny because sometimes you'll have, I guess it's like anywhere where people say, yeah, I'm from Chicago, but they'll be from Peoria or they'll be from Champaign or something like that. And it's kind of like a, a little joke. That when you meet somebody, you're always like, so where are you from? And they'll be like Chicago. Then you got a name what street you're from and who you know over there. So it's, it's weird, but yeah, Peoria is, it's out there a little bit. Woo! Different world, different world. So was yeah. Crete Monroe more like the Peoria or did it still have that Chicago influence? Um, no, it, it's not, it's not like Peoria. Um, it's kind of got a, it's actually got more of a Southern feel uh, because once you get out there, there's more like, farming and cropping going on um like you'll start seeing horses cows and stuff like that um just going down the highway um and then once you get into the town you know it's pretty it's pretty suburban uh your typical suburb of a of a city any major city um so that's that's really all it was just it's a straight 20 minute shot out of the city and, and uh down the highway and you're there so you've got city, you've got rural. What was it like transitioning to Mississippi? Uh, well, it's funny. Everybody asked me that. And it, it wasn't a big transition for me because my father's from Mississippi. Um, wow. So I spent, yeah, I spent the majority of my time, uh, most of my summers, any major holidays were spent in Mississippi um louisiana texas different all all over the south because i have family all over there tennessee so it wasn't uh crazy for me i think the biggest part was being left alone there um that was the only transition like now i'm by myself um but yeah it wasn't i always felt comfortable uh from the moment i was there i felt comfortable because i knew my surroundings um, but like I said, once everybody left me at 
on campus. It was like, now I have to find new people to, you know, hang out with. I don't have my cousins right here or my uncles or anything like that. So now I have to, you know, find my own and make a name for myself here. Was, was there a huge cultural difference? Like, like, did you listen to house music when you were in Chicago? Yeah, for sure. I love house yeah, music. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so when, yeah. go ahead. Uh, no, I was gonna say. So, when you got to Alcorn, what about like finding the music and finding like you know even the clothing styles and and stuff like that? Like, yeah, I kind of it. It is a difference in music. And again, I I kind of knew some of the music. I knew more of the old school music, um, but a lot of what they have down there is. Uh, I can't even say what it's called, um, but it's like, they call it jigging music. So they do, everything is like a dance down there. So it's 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 crazy, but it's fun. Um, and everybody kind of knows the dance and knows the same music. Um, and everybody's playing the same song. So it was easy to kind of, you have to kind of conform to what they're doing down there, you know, to have, have a good time. Um, and it's not like it's, you know, anything terrible. So, I mean, the music is good. It keeps everybody moving and having a good time and nobody's getting, you know, too rowdy and upset. Um, so it's, it was a really good time for me. Um, but like I said, the old school stuff I always knew because of my uncles and aunties playing that. But yeah, when I got down there, it was, everybody was, everybody's dancing. Like there's no, nobody's shy at all. Like nobody's sitting back in the corner. Everybody's up and they're moving. So. That was that was probably the funnest part, and it made you feel comfortable. Like, no matter who's watching, I can do. That was that was part of the dance. Like, no matter who's watching, I can do any movement, and it's okay. Um, so it was good. That is so cool. That is so cool. So you're there. You're you're getting into some of the social stuff. What about the coaching style? What about coaching in high school versus coaching in college? Big transition. So, Definitely, um, you know, because in high school, you know, you're the man uh, when you're going to college. It's some some shape or form, you're the man uh, or woman, whatever. You know, you're the top person on your team. And for me, I knew I was one of the top guys on my team. So coming in, I always felt like, you know, these guys, are they're going to have to play me right off the bat. And, you know, they were a lot more – strategic in what they were doing as opposed to are we just going to play these guys because they're the best now uh, we got to play the the guys that know what they're doing that are, we can count on every time um and they were a lot tougher uh than high school uh, i think a lot of high school coaches have to deal with some things um that college coaches don't so they because they hold you know all the power at the end of the day you know they were the ones writing scholarships you know, they can pick and choose who they want to play. Um, you know, most times they're going to play the best guys. Uh, so for me coming in as a freshman, you know, there was guys that were already ahead of me. Um, it, it was day one when I came in. So I couldn't just get out there and say, yeah, I belong. You know, I had to prove every day uh, what I was doing. Uh, so they, Humbling. we had a great coaching staff. Say it again. Humbling experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, and even the players, uh, they kind of humble you as well, you know, because they prove to you early that, yeah, this isn't high school anymore. So, uh, I mean, I still remember, and I, I'm friends with everybody that I played with, you know, through college, high school, we're still, you know, keeping contact. But, you know, I remember my first day out, um, and I had – our biggest receiver, Brinson Johnson, he came and he just ran me over. I was, for fun. And I, was that. Like, I was like, man, <laughs> this is not what I, what I was expecting. On Wake day up. One. Like, yeah, it, that's exactly what it was. And it was no, you know, I couldn't get up and be like, well, I'm going to fight him. It was like, I just had to take it at that point. I was like, I, I got to get up and just walk off the field because there's nothing, nothing you can do in that situation. And, from that day on, it was like, I got to be ready for whatever happens. I can't sit back and think that I'm the greatest because 
everybody's out here and they were the greatest at their school. So I got to show that I'm still the man. Every time I come out here, I got to work hard. And that was kind of the mindset I put in every day uh, to just come out and, you know, go hard and try to, you know, help my team as best as I could every day. So with those hits, those blows, that new style, um, any injuries? I think I think you said uh, maybe knee, shoulder. Yeah, so my uh, my freshman year, I didn't play at all. So I kind of got to build myself up. And then my sophomore year, I came into a starting role uh, as a as a corner. Um, and then I think maybe like the couple of weeks before we played our first game, I had dislocated my shoulder. Um, and it wasn't, you know, as a as a player, we all know you get hurt. Most times you're like, all right, it hurts for a little bit. I'm good to go. And um, I thought it was nothing. And I let it go on and on. Um, and until about that actually the third game. That can actually dislocate your shoulder, can it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it separated. Um, and the way it separated is it went out the back. Um, so I tore a ligament there. And, mm. I mean, it was just a quick, I popped it back in, which probably I should have told someone at that point. But I put it back and, you know, the the pain and the adrenaline was going. So I just let it go. Um, and I think we got into like the third game and I went to make a tackle and my shoulder popped out on the tackle. Um, and I was just, it was more like I was holding on to the guy and my other arm was just, it's, it's this shoulder. So the guy was just flinging on me. So we fell to the ground and I couldn't get up because I had nothing to push on. And I finally get up, go to the sideline and the trainers put me back together and they uh I think that next week or that that Monday I would have to go to the doctor and they were like, Yeah, you got a torn labrum, you know, in the back. Um, we're gonna do surgery, put it back together, and uh they were like, you know, you're done. They was like, You can play, but um, uh, you shouldn't play. So and that was my biggest thing. You know, I didn't I had never been hurt seriously, you know, you got fingers and messed up some fingers and twisted ankles, but never really something that took me out of the game where I couldn't play. Um, so that was my biggest question is, can I still play? Um, am I allowed to still go out there, you know, and play? And the doctor said, yes, technically you can play. But his suggestion was that I shouldn't. But all I needed to know was that he said it was okay uh, that I, I could play. And I just had to prove it to my coaches that I could reach above my head. I could do all these things. Um, so we go into the next game, and uh, I was feeling good. And I think we go for a punt, and I'm running down the field, and I go to block a guy, and my foot got stuck in the ground. And my body went one way, my leg went the other way. Mm. And that was my knee out of there. And shoot, that that probably the shoulder – didn't really mess with me as much, but the knee, it was, I can't even describe. It just felt like everything went numb and I was just on the ground. Just, it was almost paralyzing because you don't know. At first it's like, can I move? Should I move? Should I try to get up and walk away? And it was just like, I felt alone for, for a couple and it, it was probably only, you know, seconds that I was on the ground, but those seconds felt like hours because in the direction that I was laying, I couldn't see anyone uh, from my team's perspective. I couldn't see anyone coming to me. I couldn't see anybody coming to my rescue. So it was like, what do I do while I'm out here? And, you know, tears are coming down because I don't know what's wrong. I'm like, did I break something? What is it? And you know, when they finally got over there and I'm like, I can't feel my legs. And then they got to moving them. And I was like, okay, I can start feeling it now. And they walked me over. I'm limping. And they were like, yeah, you tore your ACL. And still, I'm like, I knew what that meant, you know, because I've heard it before. Torn ACL, you know, typically guys are done. 
but I was still like, so can I get back in? You know, and they're like, no, you're done. It's like Rambo. <laughs> they uh they're like no you're done so i was like but i can still play right they're like no take his equipment take his helmet take his shoulder pads like get his stuff away from him he can't go back in and i was like man so and that that was the first quarter of the game so i mean i'm sitting there you know for a whole hour you know on the sideline hurt you know and i had to sit there and watch my team you know uh try to try to win a game you know, without me. So it was uh, one feeling that I let them down, you know, and then another feeling that, shoot, I can't do anything about it. Uh, you know, I can't get out there and do do my job. So those were, and then the doctor came over and he's like, I thought you, I thought we said you weren't playing this game. And I was like, well, you told me that I could <laughs> play. You never said that I, you're taking me out the game. He was like, well, well you're definitely out now. So um, I had to get those two surgeries. I got the knee done first because that was the major one. Um, so I got that one done, I think, that November. And then the shoulder came into play, uh, I want to say, in, like, February. So at one point, I had a sling and a crutch. So I was looking I was looking wild out there for, for a good minute, um, trying to crutch on one and hold my body up. So it was... It was interesting for sure, but yeah, that was my first, first and only injuries uh, as wow. a player. Wow. So, would you say that going through that experience has helped you better as a as a coach now, and helping to make Definitely. sure that your athletes are prepared and that they're and that when that you don't say you can <laughs> technically you can you say no don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How has it influenced you with your coaching style now? Uh, so yeah, for me, I always, I tell guys, um, uh, you know, definitely with their injuries, because I've had some guys to the ACLs on me and, you know, I, it's always, we're looking to prevent injuries as coaches, as health professionals. That's what we're looking to try to do is prevent those major injuries. Uh, you know, some things are going to happen, fingers, you know, toes, ankles, those are those are part of the game, um, but when you start talking about tears and breaks, um, there's most times we can prevent those type of things with different strengthenings, um, you know, eating habits, all that, uh, so that we're making sure that things are tight. Um, but I'm never, you know, never the guy to be like, hey, you can still play, so go out there. But no, I'm, if you hurt, you're hurt, like, I don't want you to, because the biggest thing is you got to live the rest of your life. Um, and I don't want you going out there, you know, your knee is turned to the to the right and, you know, you still trying to go out there and play. No, you need to sit down um, and just r relax and we can put somebody else in. Um, so it's never, you know, I'm all about putting your body on the line. That was me. Um, but I think it also messed me up uh, on my road to coming back to the game. Um, and that's kind of why I had such a decline as a player, because I tried to rush back into the game. And, you know, if you take that time, most times you take the time to just rehab and do what the doctors are saying, you know, you have a lot better success. Um, and you can see it with all these, you know, players in the NFL, NBA, they do their rehab and, they take their time coming back and they come back and have great season. Um, so yeah, I, I try to stay away from pushing my players to play through pain or, you know, injuries. I say pain is a little different. You know, if it's a little bruised, I think we can shake that off and rub something on it. But, you know, as far as if you're injured, you know, I just, I'm more so worried about you and the rest of your life, the rest of your career then, you know, at that point, winning the game. Um, I want to make sure that my guys are safe and they're going to be okay tomorrow rather than if we win, you know. So that's that's my biggest thing. With COVID, um, mm -hmm. you know, they talk about the weight gain and um, COVID, COVID was very, very, very mean to me, this stay-at-home thing, because I'm telling you, <laughs> some things don't look the way they used to <laughs> yeah. based on COVID and, and weight gain. 
And um, I know that if you are, I think it's if you're 25, if your BMI is 25 or over, then you are over considered overweight. Uh, I'm trying to think, I believe so. So with that being said, BMI is fat, it's muscle, you know, it, it's, it's the, the two. So the question mm -hmm. is with, with the weight gain from COVID, like some, some of it may be fat, some of it may, may be muscle, it's hard to determine. How, right. has, how has this impacted your players? Because a player may come back, I guess, similar to the weight at weight beforehand, but they may have more fat than they had muscle beforehand or like, what are yeah, you seeing? They, what are you seeing post COVID? Oh, uh, shoot. A lot of weight. Well, yeah, a lot of weight gain. Um, and it's, it's due to the fact that a lot of it was, you couldn't leave the house. Um, so now instead of being active, whether it's an act, active can be anything because as long as I can leave the house, I can go different places and I'm walking around. But when I'm stuck in the house, all I can do is eat and sit, eat and sit. There's no getting outside. I might walk to, you know, down the street to my friend's house or to the store or something like that. Or I might walk around the grocery store. So I'm constantly in motion. But once I'm, like I said, eating, sitting, eating, sitting, I'm just letting all that rest on my body and I'm not being that I'm not able to get out and do the normal activities that I can um you know a now lot you of you tell it, me that I wish you could have told me that 10 pounds ago <laughs> yeah, a lot of it was 10 just, pounds ago I'm sorry go ahead our uh, a lot of our guys just came back and you know it was more fat than it was muscle um and like I said it was really only because they couldn't be outside and be in the gym you know, as they typically could, you know, in any other circumstance. So um, we had guys that came back, some were 30 pounds over, some were 10. Um, then you got some guys that are in a situation where they don't have, uh, they might not have the best home life. So they might not be eating at all. Um, so school might have been the best meal that they had. Uh, so, you know, they're coming back lower in weight because they don't have those opportunities to eat constantly so their meals are different yeah so um and even even still you know it's it the weight gain you know it's, it's really hard to lose that fat um but then it's also really hard to build that muscle uh, you know on a guy that was already small you know and then we take him out of a weight room or uh, eating program and now he's lost that weight again and now we got to build him back up so both on the on the same scale it's it's really difficult you know to get those guys back in shape um you know even from a conditioning standpoint everything is is rough so COVID definitely it hurt us uh, but I mean for our situation I think we we got back in shape fairly quick uh because we were able to you know follow in the different guidelines that we had um we did a good job getting our guys into the best state we could in our time frame. So relate that to kinesiology. So with them, with the with the weight gain or the weight loss, how does that now impact their <clears throat> flow on the field or their movement? So that's that's just it now. And I think so. I'll even take it back to my my own personal story um a, a reason why i believe i tore my acl was because i was too heavy um i went from being you know when i came into college i was probably like 160 pounds um and then went through the spring i probably hit you know everybody hits that freshman 15 um so i probably got to like 175 but when i came back um my first day back on campus, I was like 185. And that was the heaviest I had ever been. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, like, I was, oh my gosh. I thought, and that, that at that time, I thought that's where I needed to be in order to be successful and to play. Um, so I came back 185. I, I, in my opinion, I was looking good. Everything was fine. But, you know, I was 
something about how I was moving that wasn't natural to me. So even the way that I ran changed, everything was different. So I hadn't really learned my body yet and, and what ways I could move and be comfortable, um, you know, and be successful in those movements. And so now with guys that gain weight um, and then they think that they can still, you know, do, do jumps this way and they haven't performed those actions before, you know, in training, you know, it's really difficult. Um, you know, even guys that get small, they think they can still, you know, do certain things. And it's really about training your body uh, beforehand, before I really go 100%. You know, I want to train my body to know this is how we can move this way, what feels comfortable. You know, I tell guys all the time, you got to stay in your circle. Because um, once you get out of the circle, you don't know what can happen. Um, so if I'm in my comfortable circle, I know what these movements can do for me, then I can be successful. Now, I can work. I can work to get outside that circle and make my circle larger. All right, but if I get outside of that circle and I make the wrong move, it could be bad for me um, because I, it's, I'm in uncharted territory now. So we're so trying how to you, get how back. Do you, how do you grow then? If you don't get outside your that, circle, how do you grow? That's what I'm saying. We can, we, can, we can start to take baby steps outside, you know, further and further to the edge of that circle. Now I'm, I'm opening, I'm expanding. But if I just jump out there right now, Okay, right, okay. without knowing what I what I'm getting myself into, I haven't even tested what's right here. You know, so I gotta keep testing. All right, let's move a little further, keep moving. All right, until now I can I can expand that circle as large as I want to. Um and you know, the possibilities are infinite. Um, but like I said, I think a lot of us just get out there, we like shoot, I know I can I did it before. So even as you're getting older, you know, I know it's things that I feel like I could do, you know, maybe five years ago, but, you know, now I'm like, I don't think I want to, even when I do my pull-ups sometimes, I'm like, I used to jump up there. Now I'm like, I'm a step. I'm going to take me a couple steps and climb up there. I'm not, I don't want to just drop down. I want to take it easy. So, um, you know, I think we just got to find those, you know, scenarios where we can take the steps to get where we're trying to get to um and that's that's the biggest thing is not trying to rush it um and finding yourself again and being comfortable in your body um and you know knowing how it moves and how it works and what's going to be best for you right so i read that kinesiology also impacts mental health or or can influence trauma or 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 diffuse traumatic experiences how can kinesiology work someone going to see a kinesiology benefit in these particular areas? Um, so definitely from a standpoint of your body, kinesiology, the study of movement, you know, how it, how it works. Um, and like I said, learning your body and learning what it needs uh, to be successful for you to have a healthy lifestyle, um, you know, and, it doesn't matter what the world says, you know, whether you're skinny or big, whatever it is, as long as that you feel comfortable, you know, and what movements are working for you and what can you do um, to live that lifestyle that you see for yourself um, and just staying positive. So even if it's just walking, um, you're going in and you're just finding out where you need to be uh mentally and physically to get to that level. All right, so if I want to walk a mile, you know, let's just say in 15 minutes, um, you know, you now I'm learning what steps I need to take. Do I need to drink more water afterwards? What a, how am I feeling? How is it making me feel? Um, and that's really, uh, if I'm running, whatever, working out, if, if that works for you, because everybody's not a gym person, some people just enjoy being outside, um, doing different work. What can I do to incorporate a workout inside my own home? Some people, that, like I said, don't want to go to Planet Fitness or the YMCA. They just want to stay at home. So what things can I do, you know, to better myself in my own home where I'm comfortable? Um, and again, it's what movements can I do? Even for uh, your older 
uh, individuals. What exercises can I do just in general to, you know, stay in shape? Am I getting up in the morning, moving my limbs, you know, in all different directions, you know, so that now everything is flowing correctly um, throughout the day. So I have no blockages um, and I can, I can perform daily tasks. You know, my dad's, shoot, my dad is 76 right now, you know, and he's still running around like, you know, everything's okay because, I mean, he gets up and he does his little stretches and moves around, tries to do different things, and then he goes on about his day uh, making sure that, you know, he can actually do these things. So, and uh, the of course, nutrition comes into play as well. So it's definitely about eating, eating right, um, and I'm kind of, I'm bad with that. Most times I kind of like to eat whatever I want, knowing that I'm going to work it off. But, you know, if you're not as strong as that and you want to stick to a certain plan, you know, that's definitely something that you should do. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of different benefits, though, for, for kinesiology. Um, and definitely, it's definitely helped me uh, once I went into it because I had no idea, you know, what it was about. Uh, but being in the program and learning uh, definitely helped me change my ways and it kind of pushed me in the path of kind of a healthier lifestyle than what I was living, uh, even as a football player. So uh, it's well, I, have a question. I have a crazy question for you about kinesiology. So for me, I, I'm from New Jersey. I love house music. You know, I love that kind of dancing style. I, I was a Zumba instructor. I stopped. Um, okay. Yeah, and I, believe it or not, I was dating somebody who didn't want me to teach them anymore, so I stopped. I know, silly me. So, so the thing is, after I stopped doing that, I started trying to do some of the line dancing and the other stuff, which is like a complete, it's very technical. And yeah. I found myself getting flustered and actually gaining weight because I stopped doing the Zumba and the, um, you know, the Zumba and the house music and that kind of, because I would have my house music on. In my car, I have a tape from. So if anybody's listening to this and they and their house music DJ, I will ex definitely accept a, a CD if you want to send me one. But I have one. It's probably about five or six years ago, five or six years old. Yeah. And I would actually put it in my car and stand outside. Like there's a place where we go walking. I stand outside and I would dance for like maybe like 15 minutes to house music yeah. because I love that. And it just got my body loose and ready to walk before I walk. Right. Um, right. I've done that in a while and I feel myself I mean, like now I'm the same weight, but I'm heavier because I don't have that same tone and I don't have the same agility. Right. right. Yeah, that's that sounds like that's kind of what my mom. Um, she's she's a fitness freak right now. She's she's been on her little grind, so she can, that's her thing. She dances, um, and that's what I was saying is just what's that you know comfortable workout for you? And for you, it was dancing. So you know, like for me, I'm I'm a little shy. Um, so I might not want to dance, but that's going to work for you because, like you said, it's getting your body moving for whatever workout you're going to do next. Uh, um, you know, that's, was, that's your way of looping it up. I was 30 pounds thinner, three zero pounds thinner when I was yeah. doing Zumba, 30. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's just, uh, I mean, I can see my face and everything. And so I was just thinking when you're talking about, you know, just the understanding the movement, et cetera. For me, it's just really hard to catch on to like the technical stuff because I yeah. think I've just conditioned myself to do more fluid type dancing. Mm -hmm. So right. it's um it's it's that circle. It's you know, yeah. as you're saying, understanding your circle, like yeah. master your circle and gradually branching out. So right. yeah. yeah. Yep, that's that's what it is, honestly. Right. Just finding what's what works for you and then, you know, once I master that. I can move on. Yeah, but I want to. I want to. I want to master the dancing part. I don't want to keep mastering the weight gain part because yeah, yeah. <laughs> y'all be rolling me down the street in a minute. But, oh, but man. I wanted to ask you with regards to all this. Um, you, you have an amazing story of going through um, an injury, conquering it. And within you know, next year you were out doing uh, doing your thing. Um, and now you are coaching in that arena uh, at Elizabeth City State University. Are you doing other things? Has that experience taught you in other ways how to, um, 
do the step process, as you were saying. You know, you're talking about kinesiology has steps or layers to mastery. Are you working in a, any other areas where there's steps or la layers to mastery? Yeah, so I think coaching is uh, a career where, you know, it's everybody, every coach you, you talk to, they're always saying, what are you doing to better yourself? Um, you know, and it's constant every day we're trying to get better because not only is the game changing, but the players are changing as well. So I constantly have to be, you know, up to date on what the new training techniques are, um, what the new uh, techniques are for getting messages across to my players uh, because it used to be, you know, screaming. I was used to the screaming and yelling, you know, and the coaches really get on you, you know, and now it's, it's a lot different. Some people can't handle that. Um, you know, so it's, I, I I've seen people cry. I, I've seen yeah. people cry. like students in the classroom, you yell at them and, and they will literally start crying. They and I'm just like, down. yeah, or, or they'll, yeah, or they'll do their um, texting or they'll just walk away, you know, like not walk away, but look away and ignore you. So it's like, right. what's the point? So, right. so what have you, what have you found to work as far as communicating? Cause I find humor, right. like when I, when I joke with my kids, they're all on it. Cause you know, I like to yeah. talk junk and they can talk junk and, and they're all on it. Yeah. What have you found as far as that dialogue that keeps them engaged and excited? I think, well, for me, I'm big on relationships. Um, and you gotta have a relationship with, I mean, everybody that you come in contact with. So, you know, if I've only known you for a couple months, I have to find something quick that, you know, relates us both, um, you know, some kind of way, you know, to either, if even if you got long hair, I got short hair, you know, what you think if my hair was as long as yours, how would I look, you know, with that that type of hairstyle? Um, just to get a conversation going so that we have something to build upon. Um, because like I said, we got some guys that can shut down when you start getting on them about something they did wrong. And then you, you got to bring them back to, hey, remember when we was talking about this? Like, it's still me and you. Or it's, you know, don't, you don't have to get upset. I'm here for you. But I just want to know what's going on. You know, why why can't we come to a, a you know, a, a common ground to to get you better? Um, you know, because that's that's my job is to get you better. Um, and I think the biggest, like I said, finding that that spot where they know that you care about them, um, you know, because that's that's what we're here for. At the end of the day, it's all about relationships. Um, nobody wants to be around or play for somebody that they don't genuinely care for or that they don't care about, you know, and I mean, I, I want to know everybody on my team's name. I want to know where you're from because um, I think that's important. You know, if you don't know anything about me, um, you know, how can we ever connect? You know, how can you feel like you want to go out there and make me proud, you know, and that's, all the time I'm telling guys, whether it's the grades or something they do on the field, great job. I'm proud of you. You know, you did an amazing job, um, you know, and showing that you care and it's not just about football, um, you know, and it's about, it's about life, you know, and that's what a lot of times that's what we preach day one, that forget football, the football ended today. You know, I still have, like I said, I'm still friends with all my, former teammates because once we left football we still loved each other we were still talking and you know we could talk we could talk junk to each other and then on the other hand get real serious and be like you need to run this route the right way otherwise we don't have an issue and we'll be like okay I know you care about me I know you want what's best for me so I'm gonna go out here I'm gonna do it you know because you're getting on me not because you think you're better than me you know it's you know, it's all about the love and the camaraderie um, of the game, you know, and that's what it's supposed to be about, not just, you know, belittling anybody. Um, so that's that's kind of what I've tried to do through my career um, because I always felt like nobody did it to me. Um, you know, I didn't have – I had some good coaches, um, you know, and wouldn't take anything away from them, you know, but I didn't – until – I tore my ACL um, and my shoulder. It wasn't until then that I really felt like 
my coaches cared about me. And I had different coaching staffs. Um, you so know, you just throughout did it to career. get attention. But my, so you just my did niece, it to get attention. <laughs> you are hurt. It was crazy because when I toured, we had one coach, and then like my freshman year, the coaches were kind of they were about they were about football and winning. The second coaches I had, they were about you know just talking. They were great, you know they they were great motivators. But once you know I got hurt, it was like I didn't hear from them no more. Um, but then once these new coaches came in, you know they were constantly you know interacting with us on a daily basis, just checking in on us, how are you doing? You know, I missed, you talking about Chicago, it snowed one year, it was a blizzard. So I was trying to get back to school. No, yeah, I was trying to in get Chicago, back to Chicago. Mississippi. I was in Chicago and it was a blizzard. And my coach called me, he's like, hey, are you okay? I'm like, no, cause I can't get on the plane and come back. He was like, well, take your time. We'll be here when you get here. He was like, don't rush. I was like, okay. But that meant a lot because, you know, other, any other coach would have been like, well, you should have figured out another way to get here. So it was always, you know, I, I felt like they cared about me enough to check in on what's going on in Chicago to see, yeah, they're having a storm. So Sanders might not be here today. Um, you know, so we need to check and see what he's doing. So that's, that's kind of what I've tried to model my coaching style after is, you know, to show the players that I'm here for you. Um, you know, I'm working for you at the same time that you're working for me. So we're all, you know, connected some way. Because yeah, another coach could say, you got your legs walk. <laughs> yeah. You got your, you got two good legs. Stop walking. Yeah. <laughs> right. catch, catch your next play coming out, right? I'm so what I I agree with that. It's called positive psychology, where you it's a strength based approach where you find the good things in people and then you elevate the good. And if you elevate the good, you elevate the self confidence, you elevate right. the, um, it, I, I call it self efficacy, but the willing to, willingness to try new things. And so as they right. try new things, they start to branch out of that circle. So um, a lot of what you're doing is based on that positive psychology mold. So you're doing this with your players, are you doing it out off the field? Are you doing it elsewhere in the community? So I'm yeah, I, uh, I know what you're doing outside the community. <laughs> yeah, the field. So yeah. Right now, uh, I work for, during the daytime when I'm not at football, I should say, because I'm always working for football, but in my kind of short uh, spare time, I work for uh, River City Community Development Corporation, which is in Elizabeth City. Um, and we're a nonprofit organization uh, that does a lot of different things as far as housing assistance. Um, we offer GED. Um, we offer high school diplomas. We offer mentoring. Um, and we deal with uh, juveniles that have community service. So we have a trade school that was just built uh, shoot, a couple months ago. And its grand opening is next week. So, wow. Uh, we, wow. We, What's the name of the trade school? school? It just the uh, it's going to be the River City Trade Center, uh, so that's that's really that's it. It's and it's right next to our building, so it's it's huge and beautiful. Um, so we're expecting a lot of students to be a part of that program as well. Um, but yeah, I will take will it. Will there be a virtual component, or will it be all hands on? <clears throat> um, honestly, I don't know yet. Um, because I know we had our we had a virtual training. Um, with with the instructors, so I'm hoping that it, it'll be uh, hands on and virtual because it's I mean it's a big space you know big enough to where we could have a camera in there and still uh, show what's going on. Um, I think the the biggest part would be a student would need to have the materials uh, that we would be working on. So as far as like if we're working on plumbing, of course they would need maybe a spare toilet or, you know, a sink that they could operate on and learn as we're going along. Um, the reason why I mentioned it, doing, oh, the reason why I mentioned that to you is because when I was in New Jersey, <clears throat> I started a, um, a circle of seven program with the young men at my church and we worked with Home Depot and Home Depot has these <clears throat> different parts, I don't know, plumbing, electrical, whatever it was, but basically the, the Home Depot employees, Home Depot is required to do like a community service, service effort 
mm -hmm. or you know activities within the community. So they taught these seven <clears throat> seven young men the various trades on the list. It was thirteen departments in Home Depot. I, I don't remember. I'm you know this was a while ago, but they yeah. taught the individuals these different components on a night of the week, specifically these okay. these seven young men. So I was thinking right. as you're talking about venturing out, and let's say there's another situation with COVID or you can't, don't have access to instructors in Elizabeth City, that maybe there could be even an opportunity to partner with, let's say, Home Depot or a Lowe's or something like that, where they could virtually teach you guys some of the classes mm -hmm. or virtually come in and answer some of the questions or virtually assist. So right. just talking about possibly, it was just a thought that came to mind as you talk about. Oh, yeah. Like Definitely. I, I know I know right now that we're partnered with uh our loans that is here in Elizabeth City. Um because they're already they've already come in and do done some stuff uh in the building and on the outside. I think Wednesday they're coming in, they're doing some mulch, uh they're doing a training on how to actually put down mulch and all that. So we'll have we'll have uh I think like six students here to do that. Awesome. Um so yeah, it is it's gonna be it's going to be really great. Um, and I mean, for me, it, talking about how I use it, my style, other places. So technically, I'm in charge of uh, the community service here. So a lot of students that I get have, you know, done something, you know, in the street to put themselves in a situation where they need community service, um, you know, to pay back their debt to, you know, the community. So a lot of it for me is most times we're just talking um, because I want to know about them and what brought them into my office, um, why they're here and what they want to do to kind of change, you know, the, the path that they're going down um, because, you know, this is a small town here in Elizabeth city and it's only so much you can do, uh, but there is enough positive things out there for, you know, everybody to get into. Um, you know, and I think they just see a cycle of where it's easy. So I'm going to just go this way. Um, and I kind of, again, uh, am the biggest one telling them, you know, this is this is something different that you can do. Um, and always being positive. I have one, you know, he's all, he comes in, he's, he's real energetic. Um, but then he gets frustrated after a while. And, you know, he'll always look at me and be like, so are you giving up on me? And I'd be like, no enough I'm not gonna give up even when you give up I'm still not giving up so um and I mean I've had him you know for the longest um and I mean he's a he's a good kid you know and he's just looking for for the right direction um and I think just showing him that you know people care about him and we're looking out for him you know not trying to see him get in any trouble um you know, it's the biggest thing, you know, making sure that he's on the right path. And that's really all I want for him. So he believes in it. You know, he calls me. He's got my personal number. And he lets me know when something's wrong, lets me know when he's coming in. So we have a great relationship and it's all of them. Um, and I work with uh, ages seven to 17. Some of them are older now uh, since they've been in the program, but uh, they haven't phased out yet. So they're still working with me, but we have a great time. And like I said, a lot of it is discussion. Um, and then we might go, you know, do some community service, uh, cleaning up, helping, you know, the elderly or whatever we have to do. But, you know, everybody's attitude is really positive uh, when they come in and work. So um, the, the persons who watch these videos are, are, you know, through various states, various cities, et cetera. Um, what you're doing is phenomenal. And yes, you do need it because so many of them are used to people starting, but then stopping and not following through, you know, because they, right. they know that, um, that sometimes it can be tough. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, if somebody listening to this wanted to help you, you know, wanted to help you in mentoring and, and coaching and developing your students, how could they help you? How could they get involved? Uh, well, yeah, they definitely, you can go to our website, um, which is rivercitycdc uh, at rivercity.cdc.org. And uh, you can email us there. Um, you can call us 
252-2925. Um, that is our phone. If you want to call me, it is 252-331-6312, and I am extension 7. Um, it'll give you a, a list of options, but extension 7 is my direct line, and you can leave me a message, um, and we'll, we'll get it. My email um, is YB restitution at rivercitycdc.org and yeah i gave you my number um so that would be the best way to contact us uh we're here monday through friday eight to five um so we're we're, we're really involved in everything not just in elizabeth city uh but all over wherever we can help and, and what are some of the ways that people can assist you um, oh, oh, wait first of all if because you have a great relationship and great rapport with youth, are you available if somebody wanted you to speak virtually or you know give a presentation to the youth at their school, motivational speech oh, or anything yeah. like that? Do you do anything like that? Definitely. Okay. Yeah, I've I think I've been doing the speaking piece for a while, uh, probably since college. I was I used to go back to the high schools in different areas and talk just about my time from high school or from middle school on to college um, and what it took from there uh, because it wasn't the prettiest. Uh, so, you know, I've done that, but yeah, definitely I'd love to, I'd entertain all that. If, if it wasn't available, um, I'd love to do it. Um, any ways that you can help, we're always looking for mentors um, to come in and talk to our youth, whether it be virtual or anything. Um, you know, always looking for mentors, looking for teachers or tutors uh, that can come in. We, like I said, we have the GED, we have the high school diplomas. Um, so we help in all those phases. Um, and just anybody looking to help with the community service just to go out with us, um, you know, or find opportunity or community service opportunities for us to be a part of. Um, and those those would be the biggest helps there. Uh, if you wanted to donate as well, you can do that through our website. Um, and that is, I said before, rivercitycdc.org. Uh, and you can, there's a tab on there where you can donate directly uh, to our organization. Uh, and the money is just spread out uh, to everyone. And we can, you know, use it as we need it. We're just, just got some, a donation. So we're, uh, getting in some new tools so that we can go out uh, and do some more things, uh, getting some things done to different facilities so that we have more space uh, for our students because typically we have students in every day. Uh, COVID kind of stalled us a little bit, but we found a way to get the students in and kind of separate enough uh, so that we could have, you know, the most students in here as possible to keep them, you know, out of trouble. Um, and it's, it's been great for us, even, you know, to feed them. Uh, we're always looking for somebody to donate food uh, so that when they do come in, you know, they have something to eat. You know, some some of them come in and they haven't eaten for days, you know, so it's, it's for, good for when they can they come in. They have not eaten for days, D-A-Y-S? For days. days. Y-S, yes, days. Um, you know, we got one, she, she comes in all the time um, and she's, looking for something to eat um and she's trying to get her gd so she's been working at that every day and i mean they're always you know hungry um which is not a problem because we got food here um but like i said just to have something for her to take home or whoever it is you know making sure that when they go home they have something to eat mute 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 Can you hear me? Yeah, I couldn't hear for a second. Yeah. Okay. okay. So having something mute. I can't. Okay, now I can hear. You. So having something to take home, mentors, um, mentors, uh, volunteer opportunities, um, speakers, things like that. Those those items would definitely help you with the program. Definitely. So Nick. Um, you you you've you've been very very insightful, um, really and truly to learn more and more about kinesiology and influence on weight and and 
and trauma and so many other things, your story of overcoming, ooh, sound painful, <laughs> uh, the knee injury and the, and the shoulder injury, um, yeah. overcoming the transition from the north to the south. Uh, you, you just overcome a lot. Your story is so rich. Your story is so full. The different coaching styles, different coaching measure, measures, how it's influenced you now as a coach. Um, is there anything in particular that you can think of that we didn't discuss? And I will hint that you just said something about the transition from eighth grade, which you didn't tell me about from middle school up. <laughs> is there anything that you, uh, I catch everything I can. Is there anything in particular that you would like to share that I may have missed, um, you know, with individuals to help them? And once again, keep in mind, this is, this is really dealing with the fact that a recent NCAA report stated that um, college athletes, their anxiety level is 150% to 200% higher than their peers. So that's the whole premise of this, of these video series. Yeah. Can you think of anything else that you'd like to share? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll share. I, I, I have two stories, so they'll, they'll tie together. But my time from middle school, I wasn't always, I, I feel like before I made the transition from, uh, you know, from Chicago, I was a really great student. Um, you know, I was kind of the, I was not, not kind, I was the kid because I didn't play sports. I had nothing else to do but go to school. Um, you know, only sports was outside in the park, nothing collective. Um, so all my time was spent doing work, uh, reading, writing, math, all that. Um, and my mom stayed home with me. So that was all she had to do. And she's very smart. Um, you know, so my, my grades were excellent. Um, you know, I was in every play. Um, uh, I was doing all the speeches. You, you were an actor? Yeah, I, I had to do it. Look at you, Denzel. I was, I was, uh, for every, every, I had to do Malcolm X. Uh, all the time, I had to recite his speeches, you know, for Black History Month, all, everything. Um, you know, I, I, I did a lot of that stuff. And then once I moved, um, there was kind of a decline, you know, not only in, you know, now looking back on it, it was, the decline was not only in my grades, but kind of socially. Um, hold, hold that thought for one second. Just hold on one second. But, um. So I'm sorry, keep telling me, you, you were. So yeah, I made the transition to the suburbs and it was kind of a, I, I saw a decline in my grades. And I don't know if it was a decline or if it was just that I felt like the students at the new school were a lot smarter than me. Um, so that kind of put me in a place where I felt like I wasn't as good as them, you know? So I kind of accepted, you know, that, this is where I am and they're better. Um, and I kind of was like, I'm fine with that, you know? So I, I kind of dealt with that for a long time. I was in, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Read 180, um, which is a program to basically where you're not reading at the same level as everybody else. Um, so I was in that program for a long time, uh, up until eighth grade, um, you know, I was in, I had a math tutor um, because I was struggling in every subject. You know, I wasn't after the move. Wasn't like I was, yeah, after the move. So um, it it wasn't until eighth grade when I had two two of my teachers uh, approach me and basically say that we want you. One of them said we want you to be in honors uh, calculus and honors English, and I was like. Yeah, that that doesn't sound fun at all. Like I don't I don't want to be in the honors class. Um, you know, and you know, they they felt that there was something else in me that I wasn't allowing myself to bring out. Um, you know, so they took me out of read 180, which I was a star in read 180. I knew I could read, you know, but because they put me in there, I was just gonna, you know, be complacent and stick with it. Um, I was going to stick with just having the math tutor and, you know, still getting A's on my test because the regular math was easy for me. Um, 
But then you put me in honors and again, took me out of my comfort zone. And I had to find how to be a star in these two classes all over again. Um, you know, and I did it. Uh, it definitely wasn't the easiest road, but came out of both of them, you know, with A's and went on to high school, honors classes, uh, ended up playing sports again. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me uh, coming out of high school was, you know, I had a coach, my head coach told me, uh, you know, that I would never uh, play Division One football. Um, and that was kind of my motivation to say, you know, I'm going to prove you wrong, you know, and I don't know, uh, I don't believe it was kind of anything malicious that he was saying. Um, I think it was a lot of coaches project their players, um, and that's kind of our job to say where you would where you would go. Um, and, you know, he didn't project me as a Division One player, you know, so that was my thing to say, I'm going a, I'm to, a, I'm going to show you that I can do it. You know, I've proved everybody else wrong, you know, my whole life, you know, came back from this and that, you know, and I'm going to do this as well. So uh, went on and played Division One ball, um, spent, like I said, freshman year. I didn't play, um, but I traveled. I was one of, uh, you know, I think we had, we had a big freshman class come in. Um, only a couple guys ended up playing. But everybody else, if they, if you weren't playing, you didn't travel. And I was the only freshman that consistently traveled to every game because I knew that if something happened, I was the next man to go in. Um, and, I mean, my teammates trusted me that they knew I was ready to get in. Um, so, it, But it, it never happened. Um, we get a new coach. He comes in, has us really excited. You know, I think we won shoot, two games, but, you know, it is what it is. I told my ACL, set out that, you know, whole year. Um, and I come back, and I never really regained what I lost um, until probably now, where I feel more comfortable in my body today than I did when, you know, I was playing because I've learned you know, where I am. Um, there was a lot of things when I first came back from my injuries that I was like, I can still do, you know, all these things, um, you know, and my coaches even had to sit me down and were like, you can't, you know, transition, you know, in your back pedal as well, you know, but you can run full speed really well. So I had to make the transition from playing DB to now playing receiver. Um, and went over there and I did a great job. Um, but I never, um, and I'm not shy about it, I never got to really excel once I moved over. Um, once I had my injury, it was, I wouldn't say it was a downhill spiral, but it was kind of stagnant where nothing really changed for me. But I knew what my role was for my team and what I needed to do. So I never got uh, in a space where uh, I, I got negative or I felt like I wasn't doing my job because I always knew at the end something greater was going to happen. Um, and we went on, we won, uh, we had two consecutive seasons with nine wins, um, which is, you know, never really done. Uh, at, at that time was never really done at our school. Then we went on to win, you know, the national championship and the SWAT championship, which hadn't been done in years. You know, so I knew, you know, something else was going to happen that was greater. Um, and I kind of just never gave up, you know, hope that I could still do it. Um, and I see a lot of players now, they kind of say I'm a transfer and that's a big thing now. And, you know, when I was playing, there was no transfer. You know, you was either going to stay there or you could. But, you know, what would you get out of that transfer? And I, I just didn't want to quit something that I had started. Um, and that's kind of been my biggest thing is not to leave the job unfinished. Um, so when I went there, Alcorn wasn't a great uh, school in terms of, you know, winning. Uh, but now, you know, they're constantly talked about as being the top dog in the sweat. Um, and I, I love to feel like, 
you know, I was a part of that tradition that started, you know, the the wave of uh, the winning season. So it's definitely, definitely been good. And that's kind of where I, I try to take everything with me from all corn to Southern Arkansas um, to now Elizabeth City State University, where, you know, we're just trying to get better every day and, you know, build up as many wins as we can. Wow. So I um I did something I've never done before. So while you were talking, I was trying to write down the things that you're saying because they were all so good. So I, I one I didn't write down was the last one, right? Wait, hold on one second. So out of the things that you said, so you said that you believed in something greater, not to leave the job on not to leave the job unfinished, having a positive attitude, someone believing in you and get better every day. Did I capture pretty much everything? Yep. Those are all that, key. That those, yep. those are all very, very, very powerful points. And those are part of your success. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, it is. It's, um, I mean, I think a lot of them, a lot of players today kind of good or bad, it's kind of you get in 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 a spot where you feel like you you can't do anymore, or even if you get hurt, you feel like I still got to get out there and be the star. But it's other ways to you know contribute. Um, even if you're coming off the bench, you're that fifth man, fifth woman, whatever it is. Um, you're the utility player, whatever you got to do. Even if you're just a practice player, you know your job is still, you know, important. Um, everybody is important to the team, you know, so it's not, you know, one thing, because uh, I do a lot of quotes um, for for my players. And, uh, you know, I had one guy, you know, he didn't play as much as everybody else, um, but he was concerned. I can't hear you. I can't. Hear you. I can't. Uh oh. He didn't play as much as everybody else. Yeah, he, he was, was consistent. He came to practice. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he came to practice every day. He did everything that was asked of him, but he just could never get over the hump to beat out, you know, other guys for spots. But he was willing to do whatever you asked him to do. Um, and I thought that was always great. Um, and there was a quote uh that you know, everybody, they don't remember everybody's name, you know, on the championship team, but they remember, you know, who's the champion. So, you know, that was my biggest thing. I might not have, everybody might not have seen me, you know, and that wasn't important to me. I didn't want to be seen by everybody and be the top name on the team. You know, at, the, at that time, it was just about, I was a champion, you know, and that was something nobody could take away from me that I got the job done. I helped my team get to something that they never could have, not just saying if I was there or not, but something that had never been done, you know, in so many years. And, you know, I think everybody's mindset has to be positive, you know, in order to win at whatever the job is, not just in sports, but life, you know, in corporate America, everybody, if, if you got one person on your team that, is negative, you know, that can start an effect, you know, to trickle down to everybody else. So, you know, it was a lot of times I could have been like, man, I'm better than that guy, but I got a messed up knee, so I can't prove that I'm better than him. So there's no point in me talking, you know, saying these things. All I can do is try to make sure he's the best, you know, try to motivate him to get to where he needs to be um, and help in whatever way I can, because right now I can't show you know, exactly what I can do. So um, that's my biggest thing is, you know, trying to do your best at whatever your job is um, and go from there and not get, get complacent. Don't get complacent with where you are. Always try to get better. Where, wherever you can fit in or wherever your skills, your skills and strengths and interests are needed and can be used. One of the things that, uh, there's a quote and I don't have it in front of me, but it more or less says like, don't, don't get in the way of the man of the one who says he can do it. So more or less, those people who say that it can be done, those people who have a positive attitude, push them to the front. 
let them yeah. do what they can do. You know, if you believe it can't be done, that's okay. Just move aside and let them yeah. do it. Right. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I always try to encourage with people, you know, and uh, uh, clients, friends, whatever is find what you enjoy and keep going. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work the first time, keep going, keep going. Right. Because as long as you have that attitude of it can happen, there is an opportunity. What will happen is, as you'll start to find the collaboration, the resources, the tools, the skills, the strengths, the, the knowledge, the whatever it takes to make it happen, because you believe in it. Right. You know what I mean? So when somebody believes in something or when somebody commits to something, I always believe that there is some success in it, as long as the wrong people don't get in the way to block them or discourage them. So, right. yeah, you, Mr. Nick Saunders, are a powerful man with a powerful story of resilience and just um, insight and positivity. Um, I love your story. I love everything that you bring to the table. Um, if there were someone who was interested in going to Elizabeth City State, this is my last question, unless if you have something else you'd like to add. If there's someone who's interested in going to Elizabeth City State University and they want their application to stand out, right? They wanna really be, uh, really be at the top of your recruiting list because you are a recruitment recruiter. Mm -hmm. What can they do to stand out in your eyes? Uh, so for me, Really, of course, send me your highlight. Uh, I'm, you can find me on uh, Twitter, and it's real simple. It hasn't changed since college. It is Mr. Shutdown, all one word. What, Mr. Uh, Shutdown? Wait, wait, explain, explain, <laughs> explain. You can't say that and then just keep going. What do you uh, shut so down? When, when Twitter first started, well, I was kind of one of the first people on Twitter when it first started, but I think I had another name um, but once once we got to college, yeah, I guess it was kind of the trend to kind of create another person. Um, and my best friend, his nickname was Hard Knocks. Um, and then I was like, you know, I'm going to be Mr. Shutdown. And it was kind of a, we were naming our islands because as DBs, that's what you say, I got this is my island. So this was Mr. Shutdown's Island. That was Hard Knock Island. Um, so that we kind of created a, a different person, uh, you know, our own character. Um, and so that's that's who I who I became was Mr. Shutdown. And like I said, my best friend was across from me. He was a uh, Hard Knock. So that's that's what we came up with. And you know, I really haven't changed it. Um, I think it still it says Coach Red on there, so it has it shows everything Elizabeth City, uh, but I think it it just better helps me stand out with you know more players because they see Mr. Shutdown. You can't forget that it's a bunch of Coach Jones, you know Coach Smith, but it's only one Mr. Shutdown, so you can't forget that. Um, so uh, yeah, that was that was kind of it. We just kind of made our <laughs> made made our own characters to kind of get ourselves out there a little bit so and I just never changed it that's it isn't there a song called yeah. shut it down shut, shut shut it down something no uh it's something uh, I, I know what you're talking about I can't think of what exactly it says but yeah it's it's something shut it down when they put but, it to yeah, house music it. I'll tell you about it but, <laughs> it's <laughs> about my personal, but I think it's something like shut it down shut it down but so, Mr. Shutdown, they can send you your hi their highlight films. Should they send you um, like any uh, what do you call it, like references or anything like that, like um, you know, so, coach recommendations, or should their coach contact you? Yeah, you should definitely, like I said, put when, once you DM me. Um, of course, give me your information, high school, um, your NCAA number, uh, apply to school. And then also your your coach's number, and it doesn't matter if it's football, basketball, whatever coach you want me to talk to, uh, that can speak to your character, not just your playing ability, because you know you can be a great player and your character is you know terrible. So we want high character people um, all around us. Uh, so we want somebody that can speak to your character and say how awesome of a person you are and what things honestly that you need to work on that we can help as coaches, you know, get you better. 
Um, again, not just with football. So um, your contact information, so your cell phone, maybe your parents' number so that we can talk to them as well uh, and talk together. Um, and that's, that's about it. My email is nmsanders at ecsu.edu. Uh, so you can email me there, same thing. You can send me any of your highlights, uh, anything that you want me to view as far as your you know, athletic uh, performance is concerned. Uh, you can send me your grades. You know, that's a big thing. Uh, making sure our, our school, you're required to have a 2.5 uh, to get into Elizabeth City State University, uh, as well as taking all your core classes. So, of course, four years of, uh, you know, language, uh, two years of a foreign language. Uh, you have to have all the math uh, and the science. So you can look into that. Uh, our website for Elizabeth City for the actual school is www.ecsu.edu, and you can apply there uh, through our admissions tab. And then we have a questionnaire on our football tab, which is you can find the athletics tab, uh, but it's ecsuvikings.com, uh, and that's where you can find all our sports uh, avenues regardless of what sport it is we have everything on there cheerleading bowling uh, golf tennis uh, basketball cross country so we have everything here um, so you can find us there That's as well as on twitter yeah. coach thank you so much for everything everything i'm gonna ask one last time any additional parting words, any last words that you would like to make sure that you share, get across, anything that I forgot to mention um, during our conversation today that you think might help student athletes, especially, especially with handling the pressures that come along while they are, um, you know, in a new environment, away from home, new classes, new coaches. Um, my last thing would be, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, I think a lot of us, it's kind of the, regardless, male or female, it's kind of the macho thing that you feel like you got it and you don't need help or you don't want to ask for help. But, you know, there are people here that are willing to help you with whatever you have going on, whether it's grades, uh, school, you know, social life, uh, whatever it is, you know, there's somebody that you can talk to um, and know that, you know, you can confide and find that person that you can confide in um, and talk to them about whatever's going on um, and ask them those questions. And don't, it doesn't have to be a friend. It can be somebody older. It doesn't have to be your mom or dad. It can be a coach. It can be a teacher, whatever it is. But find that person that you can trust um, and, you know, be able to talk to that person uh, about whatever is going on. With, without any judgment and be that same person for someone else. Um, now that's probably it, you know, just stay positive and, you know, finish the job. Finish the job, finish the job. I like that, I like that. So um, Nick, thank you so much for everything. Um, I really appreciate this. I'm going to uh, um, make a YouTube out of this, send it to you and get your feedback. And, and once you say yes, we will, uh, I'll give you the link and we'll share it. Um, we'll share it with everyone. But once again, thank you so much for okay. everything. I really appreciate your insight. No problem. Thank you for having me. Okay. Hold on.